Okay. So, uh, as Scott said, the urine free to play games. I'm Steve Moretzky, Juan Grill, Dave Rawl. So, the free to play industry is, of course, much older in Asia, but in North America, it's really only been around as a mass market uh, business model for about six or seven years. And in that short span of time, it's gone from Wild West to a pretty mature and stable market. So it's a good time to review what are the characteristics of a mature market. Well, as companies see success in a market, they rush into it, and the market gets really crowded. And in a really crowded market, companies try to differentiate by raising the production bar. And also, the expectations of the player base goes up. And of course, as the production bar goes up, costs soar, usually faster than the market is growing. And this makes the decision makers get really nervous. Executives get more conservative. They don't want to green light anything that isn't very similar or, frankly, exactly identical to a successful product in the marketplace that they can point to. And so the pace of innovation slows down and everything starts to look all alike. So think of this as a survival guide. We're going to be taking a dive into six interesting areas of free-to-play gaming. And hopefully we'll be teasing out what incremental developments are going on in this mature landscape and how you can survive and hopefully thrive in it. So the first area we'll be looking at is the social builder genre, or in Zingalingo, the, the invest and express genre. There are really five games in the genre that are dominating the top grossing charts. There are a couple of farm games. There's Farmville 2 from Zynga, which was launched in September of 2012. Heyday from Supercell, which launched in June of that year. Then there are a couple of games that are based on animated TV comedies. One is The Simpsons Tapped Out from EA Mobile, and that launched in March of 2012. And then the newest one of the five, Family Guy Quest for Stuff from Tinyco, which just launched a few months ago, and the most venerable one in the group, The Sims Free Play from EA Mobile, which launched in the waning days of 2011. So let's look what these five games have in common. One thing is really deep gameplay loops. If we go back to Farmtown in early 2009, the game that launched the farm craze and, in fact, really the entire social builder genre, the gameplay was super simple. You planted crops, later you harvested those crops, sold them at the market for in-game cash, and every now and then you would accumulate enough in-game cash to buy and place decorations. And that's it. That's the whole engagement loop of the game. Now let's flash ahead just a few years to heyday, where you're still planting and harvesting crops, but now you can sell them to individual customers who visit your farm or you can put together orders for nearby businesses, or you can use the roadside stand to sell them to other real players of Heyday, or you can turn them into food for your animals, or you could craft them into more complicated and more valuable foods, or you can put together big time-limited orders and ship them out on the riverboat. So while the gameplay loop in Farmtown looks like this, the gameplay loop in Heyday looks more like this. So incredibly uh, deeper and more complex gameplay just over, over several years of development. Another commonality are really high production values. Let's look at this screenshot from Farmville 2. Harvested crops dance until you pick them up. Trees that are ready for picking sparkle with fairy dust. The long grass waves lazily in the wind. The UI elements seem to bob and weave. Even the smallest touches, like the handle on this well swinging slowly back and forth. There's hardly a, a spot on the screen that isn't in motion. And it's not just high production values, but incredible uh, quantity of content as well. All these games feature just 
mind-boggling amounts of quantity, uh, quantity of content. And all five of these games also feature a leveling system, where you collect XP through in-game actions, and when you accumulate enough, you level up, and that unlocks new content. And they all feature a dual currency system, a soft currency that you generally earn through in-game actions, and a hard currency that, uh, for the most part, can only be bought with real-world currency. But it's also as, inter as interesting to look at what these games do not have in common. So one thing is the first user experience. Both Heyday and Farmville feature a very brief tutorial. And then you're on your own, and additional tutorials come in whenever a new game feature or system unlocks. Whereas uh, The Simpsons Tapped Out has this incredible tutorial that just feels like it goes on for days. And Missions. Uh, the Sims and Farmville both have very familiar uh, mission systems, uh, like in many social games, perhaps one to three missions open to you at any given point in time. Uh, the Simpsons has this incredible character-driven mission system on steroids that really leaves me feeling like I have no agency at all. And Heyday has no mission system at all. And before I played Heyday, I never would have thought that you could do a game with such deep loops and complexity as heyday without a mission system to you know kind of direct and drive the player but it works and it works incredibly well uh, building grid is, is another difference so Farmville uh, tapped out and the Sims all feature a building grid although as you can see the camera angle and build mode is wildly different in the three games heyday has no build grid at all so when you're placing a decoration or a building, you just have to move it around until it turns green, and that's how you know it can be placed there. Which is kind of a pain in the ass, but it also gives the game kind of a more natural and organic feel. And Family Guy kind of splits the difference. They have a building grid on things that you've already placed, and no grid on the unbuilt areas. Which, to me, kind of seems backwards from the way I would have done it if I was going to explore a hybrid solution like that. And then finally, there's interior versus exterior building spaces. So the two farm games and the two animated TV show games, uh, they all feature exterior building spaces. The Sims, while it does have a neighborhood building component, the focus is really building out and decorating an interior space. So now for the lessons. One is, this is a genre with incredible staying power. Uh, four out of these five games are two years old or more, uh, and still going strong. Uh, thanks to the amount of investment that players make when they play these games, it makes them really, really sticky. Uh, next is, despite the fact that this genre has, has been developing over a number of years now, uh, it's surprising that, there, that there's still a lack of convergence on sort of a single universal ideal feature set. And uh, the last point is that this really isn't a place where you want to venture. Uh, with the high production values, the huge amount of content needed to compete in this space. You know, you really don't want to go there unless you're already established, or unless you've got a killer IP, uh, or unless you've got a big mountain of venture capital cash that you want to burn. One. <coughs> Shot it on Steve. So, here you go. Hi, everybody. I generally play a lot of puzzle games. I consider myself a hardcore puzzle gamer. Uh, uh, it's that thing, and I, I, I know a lot of game designers have this thing in common where we crave to find that little puzzle game that nobody knows about, and then we can show it to our friends, like when we show up to their houses with a special bottle of wine or bottle of whiskey and saying, let's try this one, it's really, really good. So I always have a lot of different cool puzzle games on my phone. And here's some examples of them. This one is called Line. And it's basically a game where you have to connect the, the nodes based on the colors. This other one is called Strata. And it's a game where you have to paint lines, making sure the top line matches the squares at the bottom, the bottom, the surface of the board. 
Boro 3s and Color Sense are other games I really enjoyed uh, in the past uh, 12 months. Lately, there's a game called Watercolors. Uh, I don't know if anybody has downloaded it. It's about painting lines with different colors and combining them, co combining primary and secondary colors and solving a maze. Uh, it's actually really, really interesting. It, I downloaded it last week, so that's why it's not in this presentation. Um, and the, the, the contrast with the really, truly successful commercial games is striking, right? Um, and for a really long time, I thought the problem was the theme, right? The way we look at line and it says this beautiful abstract uh, maze that you have to connect lines with colors. And, uh, and then we look at Farm Hero Saga, which is about fruits and a f metaphor of a farm and collecting and harvesting. And, and for the longest time, I always thought that that was the problem. Um, and uh, it, I started thinking uh, uh, about, about this a lot, trying to solve why those games, even, even when they had an increasingly uh, big promotion from the app stores, they don't really maintain themselves on the top 100 grossing chart. So are really cute monsters or colorful fruits necessary for a puzzle game to succeed? And if you ask most of my game friends, my game designer friends, they will say, oh, it's just a problem of the great unwash who's unable to appreciate these games, right? And we have always taken that snotty view of the world. The rest of the world is not ready for these games, right? Uh, and I started looking into this, and my research has shown me that that's not necessarily the case. And I'm going to have an, a, a, an example. Last year, there were a bunch of really great puzzle games. This is one. Uh, it's called Learn to Fly. And it's based on, a, on, a, uh, on an idea of connecting different parts to um, a, bring the energy to the little toy plane. So a little bit more accessible in its metaphor and in what, um, a, what you have to do as a player. Right? It's fun. Um, and when one thing that I noticed on this game, and that drove me to look into other games, is that the problem in this particular game is that there is only one solution, which is fine for the first 10 levels, right? People are learning, the levels are pretty easy. But then once you go in level 11, 12 of Learn to Fly, trying things, in order to solve the level, you have to try things, the same thing over and over and over. And if you don't get it right, you have to backtrack your steps. It's not that you can solve it somehow. And that's not the case in commercially successful puzzle games. So for example, in Farm Hero Saga, I always have an opportunity to fix my mistake. I, I could have not gotten the right match, but um, I will always be able to, as long as I have uh, enough moves, I will be able to correct and, 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 and I have many different ways to get to the outcome. Hmm? And I, I particularly love the flowers in, in, the, in this level, that, that flower down there, where you have to make matches adjacent to it. And there's several different ways of actually making those adjacent matches. And you will get to the flower eventually. It will take you maybe two moves or eight moves, but you'll get to it. So at the end of the level, when you finish the, the uh, um, uh, Farm Hero Saga, you'll see that um, if you win, you're, you're, uh, obviously uh, you're happy. But if you lose, you see in the puzzle that, oh, but I could have done it this way. It's not that I don't know how to solve this level. I should have done it in less moves, which is a completely different thing in your mind. And uh, when we were rehearsing this presentation, uh, Steve pointed out that if you only have one solution, it's a game about skill and not luck. And it's, it's, we all know how fun it is to receive something that you're not expecting, right? To attribute luck or, or to attribute you know, something else that gives you that element. It's very rewarding. Um, and uh, a, Dave, in, this, in the same conversation, he said, that's the difference between a puzzle and a puzzle game. And I think as game designers, we make puzzles. But the, the commercial ones, the, commercial, the successful commercial ones, are puzzle games. And we need to keep that in mind. Um, my mother-in-law, the mathematicians, is Kofa Candy Crush. 
because she actually plays this really hard puzzle. She, she even uh, collects these objects that you have to, it's like a magic cube, a, a, a Rubik's cube with est on asteroids. It's like really complex puzzles. She loves them. And uh, it's basically, uh, she is part of a small minor minority. And when we make puzzle games the way that we think, game designers think that we should be making, we need to keep this in mind, that we need to game, make games for the majority of us. Um, and the other thing that is also very important is that when the, there are little achievements that we complete across the level, in other words, when I beat that flower in, in, in Farm Hero Saga, it's just a portion of the level that I had to solve. So the more rewards I have in those levels, the better I'm going to perform in the game, the better I'm going to feel performing in the game. If the only reward is only achievable at the end of the level, then as a game designer, I'm losing those opportunities to give those little shots of dopamine to the players to keep them engaged in the level and, and also to make the final ev evaluation if they lost. If they lost and they said, oh, but I beat two of the three flowers, right? I'm close. If I didn't get to solve the level, then I suck. I'm going to move into the next game. So in conclusion, I originally believed that any good puzzle game needed a good thing to succeed. And I was wrong. I, through this research, it demonstrated to me that regardless of how awesome your theme is, you need to design systems in your puzzle games so players can achieve victory in different ways without the need to backtrack. And after solving every challenge, make sure to offer the player a visual reward that allows them to get those shots of dopamine, make them feel good. All right, sorry to be uh, slow in getting up here, but uh, those chairs are really, really comfortable over there. Just letting you know. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about an analysis I did of uh, real-time strategy games on the App Store. And uh, even though they're not necessarily the most casual things, I think there's still some very relevant lessons there for casual game designers. Um, so in case anybody missed the memo, Clash of Clans from Finnish developer Supercell is a massive crushing success. Currently, it's the number one top grossing in the US App Store on iPhone. However, on iPad, it's number one. And on Google Play, yes, you guessed it, number one. Um, and this is not like an outlying day or week for these guys. Uh, Clash of Clans has been among the top three grossing on both iOS platforms for 21 months continuously and since three weeks after release on Google. Right, the game is absolutely crushed. And you know, given that it's been a big free-to-play success, you gotta ask yourself, where are the imitators? Um, you know, as Scott mentioned, we've been doing this lecture series for a while. Um, in 2011, I did a section called Everything Has to Be a Frontier, about how Frontierville mechanics were being recycled and repurposed. 2010, I talked about how everything had to be a farm, uh, going a little further back. In 448 BC, I talked about how everything had to be a Doric column. And in 1.7 million BC, everybody was ripping off rocks. Of course, I was slightly younger and better looking when I did that lecture. Uh, certainly, even in the era of the App Store, we see a fair amount of following and people trying to capitalize on popular paradigms. If you take a look at the top 100 grossing apps on iPhone, there are 10 different match three games in various revenue positions. But when we look at Clash of Clans clones, there are only two, right? Clash of Clans, a massive crushing top performer, and Castle Clash, which has done meh, bounces around a fair bit, does a little worse on iPad, uh, grossing a little better on Google Play, uh, where it actually does pretty well, top 25. So is it just that everybody decided that they didn't want to bother copying this particular category? Um, here's a quick list from a great website called copycoc.com that you know tracks Clash of Clans clones up. Folks are trying. Um, Maybe it's too hard to copy. You know, the game has a lot going on. There's base building, you manage multiple resources, do columns of troops, you have really uh, interesting real-time battles. Um, as you can see from these screenshots, um, folks have copied it pretty efficiently. Mechanics, UI, visual style, game balance, even marketing approach. So that's not it. So uh, maybe a little closer examination is merited. 
Uh, if we take a more careful look at these match three games in the top 100, we find not just one game mechanic, but actually six distinct variants on match three with no more than three products in any subcategory. Uh, there's a lot of different creative spins on there. Um, as long as you're doing something a little bit different, the market is making some room. So um, I'll just stop the action for a moment and admit that I cheated a bit uh, earlier when I showed you that uh, list of real-time strategy games, I only included strict clones of Clash of Clans. If we widen the lens a little bit, um, there's another real-time strategy game that's been finding a lot of success lately. Shot up into the top 10 and has been a fixture there since launch. Uh, the game is called Boom Beach. When you take a look at it, at first it might feel a little bit like more of the same. You're building a base, you're managing multiple resources, building troop types, sending out columns, leveling them up. Um, there's a lot of similarities, but as you go through the game, you see some real differences. For instance, it begins when you go to attack something outside your base. In Clash of Clans, you can get a random live opponent, random human opponent, um, at roughly your level, or you can go through a single linear campaign. In Boom Beach, the player has an ever-expanding map of the world populated with islands that seamlessly interleave PvP battles with single-player battles, allow the player to build their economy by conquering more and more islands and fine-tune that economy by conquering resource-generating bases. And it includes not one but two distinct linear narrative campaigns. In battle, the differences are even more profound. Rather than having to defend your base from all sides, as you do in Clash of Clans and the Parade of Clones, troops can only be landed on the beaches. So you, you sort of build to defend from those areas. Likewise, the attacking player has a gunboat, which has its own separate reservoir of energy that can be upgraded, can be teched up, um, that you use to shoot off a wide variety of power-ups that do everything from heal your troops to knock down ranges of buildings to temporary disabling towers. Um, it's actually, at least for me, a lot more fun piloting these battles. I feel like I can get involved directly, solve problems, do much more, right? They really up the ante on that experience. So, after all this fast following, who had the guts, who had the nerve to throw down with Supercell? Who would dare challenge this high and mighty competitor? Uh, as it turns out, Supercell. Um, they're the only folks who really decided, rather than trying to do a strict fast follow, that they're going to take the formula, improve on it, shape it for a different audience, make something good happen. So, what can we learn from this brief bit of research? First of all, the App Store is showing a bit more of a limited tolerance for cloning than, say, the historical Facebook market, right, where 19 farm games reached a million plus DAU. Um, if we look at most genres, only two to three very similar games have managed to get into the top 100 grossing. This is even more true in the mid-core and hardcore spaces where players are often encouraged to group together socially and to collaborate, creating a, a strong social barrier to exit. However, if you can make some meaningful tweaks on the formula, there is real potential there no matter what you're doing. Uh, a better mousetrap can be built and it's still valid. And not a whole hell of a lot of people have even tried in this category against the number one revenue generating game in the universe. So there's still a lot of commercial potential to be captured by smart iteration on this formula. Now we turn to the super hot area of social casino. Um, so I see this genre divided into four distinct subgenres. There are the slots only apps like Slotomania, which uh, was uh, one of the originators of the social casino category, and My Vegas Slots and Jackpot Party Casino. Then there are the bingo only apps, um, most notably Bingo Blitz and Bingo Bash. Then there are the poker-only apps, and the king of the hill there is certainly Zynga Poker. And finally, there are the apps that try to uh, replicate the casino experience and offer uh, a full array of gambling game genres, such as Double Down Casino, Big Fish Casino, and GSN Casino. And even after mentioning all of these different titles, there are still five other titles in the top 25 grossing list on one of the four major platforms. In fact, Social Casino dominates the top grossing charts 
across Facebook and the various mobile platforms uh, well ahead of the number two genre, which is puzzle progression, such as Candy Crush Saga. So normally, we save the takeaways till the end of the section, but here I'm gonna start with the takeaways. And the two takeaways here are that social casino games are becoming more and more like their real world counterparts. And the other top takeaway is that social casino games are becoming less and less like their real world counterparts. Huh? Well, let me explain. First, I'll start with the ways in which they're becoming more and more like land-based gambling games. For one thing, brands are becoming more important and more prevalent. IP has been very important in land-based slots for many years, and now that's becoming true in social slots as well. Another area is the growing sophistication of social casino companies. Um, a few examples of that. One is the diversity of different mechanics. So a great example of this is to look at Slotomania, where they have this long progression of slot machines that you unlock, and they're constantly adding new ones to the, to the end of that progression. So you can kind of see the whole history of Slotomania development laid out within their app. And their early slot machines are basically all reskins of the same 3x5, 20 line machine. But if you look at their more recent offerings, you see a growing diversity of slots mechanics, such as this so-called way game, where every single possible pay line is a pay line, offering over a thousand ways to win. And another case of this growing sophistication is in the use of real choreography and in the use of audio to really build up and enhance these win moments and these near win moments. Uh, and to illustrate that, uh, I'm going to show uh, a couple of videos from Zynga's Hit It Rich slots. So first, a normal spin, where only a single bonus symbol comes up. But uh, during that spin, there was a normal amount of audio, just played a little do 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 do. Now during the second spin, two bonus symbols will come up, and that triggers sort of an anticipation moment where the real spin takes longer and the audio kind of goes into a more frenzied state. So two bonus symbols have come up, and now the other reels take longer, and the sound crescendos and the player's heartbeat goes wild. Um, and then a, a final example is exploiting known psychological fallacies of gamblers, uh, such as being able to detect patterns where patterns don't exist that will predict wins, or giving players the feeling that they have control over the outcome. And uh, again, I turn to an example from Hit It Rich Slots. This screenshot is taken in mid-spin. And you can see that during the spin, the spin button changes to a stop button. And if you click that, the reels stop almost instantly. But this has not one iota of an impact on the outcome of the spin. However, it gives players the illusion that they have some control over what happens with each spin. Now, in what way are social casino games becoming more like social games? An obvious example is unlocking. In apps like Slotomania or Jackpot Party Casino, you start with a single slot machine unlocked, and then you have to grind to unlock additional slot machines. Of course, there's no analog to this in the real world. When was the last time you walked into Caesar's Palace or the Bellagio and saw this? Another example is in uh, the area of socialness. Uh, we've seen social interactions with strangers for years in Zynga Poker. Uh, now we see it in Big Fish Casino also, where you're placed into a room with several other players strangers, not friends, and you see when they win, they see when you win, you can exchange congratulatory messages and even minor gifts. And there are games with a building component, such as My Vegas Slots, where as you grind, you're unlocking real world Vegas casinos and placing them to build out the Vegas Strip. And time limited content, like this July 4th themed collection mechanic in GSN Casino, which runs only for the month of July. Or good luck charms that actually work. 
like these in Vegas World, which the player purchases for hard currency and which increase your payout. And finally, classic mission systems, like we've seen in many other social games. Uh, this one is from Gamehouse Casino Plus. So what are the lessons? The first is that social casino is one of the most lucrative, if not the most lucrative, free-to-play genre today. As I pointed out, uh, 30 out of the top 100 grossing games right now are social casino apps. But this doesn't necessarily mean that you should be rushing into social casino. Uh, that might have been the case a year or two ago, but now that market has become quite saturated, um, and there are some very dominating players uh, players with very powerful relationships and pretty deep pockets. And secondly is that a social casino draws upon both principles of land-based gambling games and social games. And it's important to know when to draw upon one and when to draw upon the other and how to do both well. One. So last year, when Flappy Bird happened, um, eh, I started looking at the behaviors of, of, of players and the time that were investing in Flappy Bird. And as a, as a game developer, uh, I got very curious about this because I see the other side of, of the world, which is we spent nine months a year making a game where we thought that we were going to get, you know, you playing for a couple of hours, and it turns out that this guy makes a game in six weeks or in four weeks, and, 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 and you actually play more than you actually play my game. So I started looking at the behaviors of players, and as I'm starting to do research, I'm starting to look at some very interesting games that are appearing on the top 10 on the app stores, on the free download charts. This is one, it's called Piano Tiles. And it's, it's a game where your goal is to touch the back tires before they go off the screen. That's a game. And you would think that such a simple game would not, would not be as successful as, as the other free-to-play uh, uh, games uh, available. After all, they're free, right? Um, and this is the up any chart for Piano Tiles. Since it was released a few weeks later, it climbed up to the top 10 and he stay in the top 10. He has been cloned extensively, so there's now like five different versions, and they're all in the top 30. Let's look at another one. This one is called 100 Balls. And this is a game where you have to tap the screen at the right time in order to drop balls into the passing cups. If you don't drop the balls into the passing cup, you lose the cup, and if the balls miss the cup when they fall, you lose the balls. The game ends when you lose all your cups. I just explained you the whole rule set of 100 Balls. This is it, right? You think, who will be playing this game? Turns out there are a lot of people. That red line over there is when Apple featured it. And it's been at the top for months, and now it's just now winding down. Some of these games start small, but they become much bigger games over time. This game is called Flappy Golf. And we'll see how in the first level that's shown here, your, your, uh, the mechanic is pretty simple. You tap on the right to flap to the right, you tap on the left uh, of, of your phone to uh, flap to the left. That's your goal. But this is an example of level 60 where this bubble uh, gun balls. So you attach to them and you have to play with a strategy in order to get to the hole. There's a lot of different elements of gameplay, and today Floppy Golf includes 200 levels and local and online multiplayer modes. And the interesting thing about these games that people have not noticed, uh, uh, at least in the industry yet, is that as these games are installed on people's phones, developers are taking the opportunities to cross-promote their other games, and they use the push notification systems to do so. So when you um, get a push notification from Flappy Golf, this is what you get when you enter the game. This is one of the other games. So 
it's not about just making one game. It's about making a network of games. And hello, PowerPoint. PowerPoint is going to crash. All right. Sorry, guys. I'm going to restart the, the presentation. Yeah. Just restart PowerPoint. Okay. I know, I know. We keep we keep bringing a Steve laptop. And he's the only one that uses Windows. <laughs> Clearly, <laughs> you can tell. <laughs> right, that's a great question. <laughs> totally luck. All right, okay. Here we go. Mhm. Mm Okay. And the monetization model that I have seen so far is clearly ads. Uh, you can see ads at the bottom of the screen in, in, in the results uh, a screen of piano tiles. And the only, even though they, 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 they are listed as free to play games, the only uh, in-app purchase I have seen is removing ads. Some people have tried with some other things, but it, it clearly, they clearly don't know how to really monetize their players in the majority of these games. There are some exceptions, but in the majority of the games, they don't know how to monetize the players with in-app purchases. So, so the, most developers uh, 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 use uh, a, a remove ad feature. And in terms of monetization through in-app purchases, it's clearly shown that they are not uh, at, the, uh, at, at the grade level. For example, this is the, the app any top uh, grossing chart for piano tiles. And you can see that um, they, they, they picked at the 600 or, or third position on the, on the top grossing chart, which is more or less 700, 750 dollars a day. Um, so clearly, that developer is not making money from in a purchases or a lot of money from in a purchases. But at the same time, the development investment is really low. So creating a network of, of apps, it seems, is where the thing is at because they can generate tons of impressions and they get paid commissions from the uh, from the ads that have been displayed on those games. And, and a lot of times there are games. Uh, Supercell is using all these games to drive traffic to their games, for example. And Clash of Clans is being advertised heavily on micro games. Um, and unfortunately, and because of the production time frames being so short, cloning is so much easier to do than casual games. If you thought that casual, cloning casual games was a problem, in, micro, in the micro games uh, in, uh, ecosystem is even worse. And this is an example. This game is called Follow the Line. Uh, and it's very simple. You just need to use your finger to drag left and right as, as the, the screen is, scro is scrolling down. And it picked at first place on the App Store most downloaded games uh, on the free chart for many weeks, for actually uh, two and a half weeks. Um, and it stayed in the top 10 for a really long time. And some of you might be familiar with this game, 2048. And it's a game very similar to the critically acclaimed game Threes. Uh, the publisher of 2048 is a French company called Ketchup. And 2048 has been extremely successful, as it is like Threes, but it's free. So Ketchup decided to start cross-promoting other games, and they created a game called The Line. And uh, basically, this is the up any chart. Day two, at day two, they were in the sixth position on the App Store, the sixth most downloaded app on the App Store. So the ecosystem of installing applications across the board that are, that are all going to the same network is clearly working. Lastly, I want to mention that there is a huge need for micro games to evolve a little bit um, and, uh, and, and have an easy way to, for players to challenge and compete with friends. I grabbed this screen from Facebook. This is one of my Facebook friends. Collect, it's taking screenshots of all her scores in piano tiles, creating a collage of it, and posting it on Facebook. So this, that's the only way that he could, she could actually share it. And as I was working on this presentation, Gameloft last 
Friday released a game called Ninja Up, and it's a micro game. And, and it basically, it's a really cool micro game. I invite you to get to download it. And it has a Facebook leaderboard. Um, and uh, it, it, it has ads to promote their own games. So this, I don't have really strong conclusions about this. This is a, a, an area of gaming and mobile gaming that I've been looking at really closely after Flappy Bird. Um, but I think there, micro games are becoming increasingly popular. And players don't distinguish between um, a Clash of Clans or Piano Tiles. It's just a game that I want to have 15 minutes of fun with. And this could be dangerous for the industry in terms of uh, if players really just want 15 minutes of fun, then why would we make bigger games, right? But we'll see what happens. Ads are clearly the main monetization scheme. Um, and uh, uh, developers are building a network of games, cross-promoting their games, clearly, uh, and they're building audience uh, and creating more other impressions. Um, so in this final section of the talk, I'm going to take a look at some interesting design lessons for casual games that come from a perhaps somewhat unexpected place. Um, so at GDC this year, I did a talk on uh, different subgenres of collectible card games and sort of how they stacked up against platforms. Um, as part of my research for that talk, I wound up uh, playing a bit of Hearthstone, a new digital collectible card game from Activision Blizzard. Um, as time went on, I developed a bit of an interest in the game. Um, and even though we felt like a deep dive on it was maybe a little too hardcore for Casual Connect, I still think that there are a lot of good takeaways to think about for your casual game. So without further ado, first observation. You can do a lot better than the stale, standard, daily bonus and mission systems that are prevalent in casual games, especially builders. So if you take a look at the typical casual game daily bonus, um, it's pretty bland, it's pretty uninteresting. You start up the app, you get a little bit of currency, you come back tomorrow, you get a little more. Um, it's not gameplay, it's not engaging, it's not meaningful. Hearthstone skillfully replaces this with a single daily task. Users get one per day, whether they complete it or not. Um, this task usually requires them to play the game for about 30 to 60 minutes in order to get that currency reward. So it rewards real engagement and draws users into the game. The game limits users to having three missions active at once. So if you fail to complete missions or fail to log in for four or more consecutive days, you start to incur opportunity cost. And because these missions are the main source of in-game currency, or at least one of the main sources, that opportunity cost is very real for players who want to advance and, and grind in the game. Um, likewise, you see a lot of casual games using a, a task list system to organize and shape gameplay. Um, these are generally very explicit, right? They tell you exactly what to click on, what virals to send. They don't leave a whole lot to the imagination. They tend to be very constrained, um, but they do sort of shape the experience regardless. Um, they're in a cascade. So you always have a set of missions active. The moment you finish one, another one appears. Um, after a while, this can kind of get to feel like an infinite treadmill, where there's a joy of completion and then a dread on arrival as you realize you're going to have to throw 400 more clicks and 400 more energy at the next task. Hearthstone actually solves this problem with the same system. So in order to obtain the currency reward for the daily task, the player has to play the game in an unusual way. They get one high-level direction, win a few games with this class, cast a lot of cheap creatures, a lot of expensive creatures, a lot of non-creature spells. And they need to figure out how to shape their gameplay to chase that goal. It makes accomplishing every mission feel fresh and exciting. Looking at another ingenious design aspect, they've managed to take a PvP game and make it great for both payers and for non-payers. You don't see this a lot in the casual world. Casual games tend to divide into one of two buckets. You get games like Mafia Wars, where players can buy the best items. Payers have huge competitive advantage, right? Folks have either viralized heavily or paid quite a lot and dominate non-payers. These games tend to drive a lot of revenue per user, um, but they can attrit users fairly quickly when they realize they can't be competitive. 
At the other end of the spectrum, you see games like Words with Friends, where the playing field is pretty level. The unfortunate thing is that there tend to not be many purchases. The ones that are there are not very compelling, and they're often one time, right? Um, this means that although you can go very wide and retain a wide base of players, the revenue per user is often pretty anemic on games of this type. Blizzard neatly splits the difference by allowing Hearthstone to be played in two different ways. Uh, one that favors pairs, one that does not. In play mode, players take all the cards in their collections and shape the best deck that they can to compete with other players. There are over 400 cards available in the game, so there's a wide variety of deck options to build, but gameplay is often dominated by ultra-rare, extremely powerful legendary cards. These cards are very hard to obtain. Players typically get them by buying a very large number of random card packs and opening them to, to sort of see what they can get out of it. In this mode, it's hard to compete without those legendaries. Payers have a clear advantage. The second mode is called the arena mode. In the arena mode, players are not allowed to touch their collection of cards. Instead, three random cards are presented at a time. The player picks one to put in their deck and repeats this process until they have a full deck. They can't pay more to get better card selection, more card selection, anything more favorable. The power level of all the decks is roughly comparable and play skill is dominant. Of course, Activision Blizzard wouldn't want to have no way to monetize this gameplay, so they do allow players to pay cash for the opportunity to compete on this level playing field. By having these two distinct modes and ways of competing, one that favors play pairs and one that sets a level playing field, they're able to go both broad with audience and deep in terms of monetization. Right? It brings a lot to the game's popularity and, and viability. Third interesting design note, they do not hide their best items behind a paywall. Typical casual games look like this. There are two currencies in the game, a soft currency earned through gameplay and a hard currency earned by purchase. For games that have this system, typically the best, most powerful items in the game are available only for purchase. They cannot be earned through gameplay. Hearthstone has two currencies, gold and dust, but they're managed very differently from these soft and hard currencies. Gold is earned by completing missions and winning games. It's used to buy packs of random cards to add to your collection and to compete in the arena mode. Interestingly, everything in the game that can be purchased for gold can also be purchased for cash. Dust is the currency that players use to craft cards. Uh, it's created by recycling unwanted cards, also one little bit through gameplay. This is what you use to get those ultra-powerful legendary cards to put in your deck. There is no way to buy dust. There is no way to buy these cards directly. Players need to grind their way through it, either through bulk purchase or massive gameplay. How has this unconventional approach to monetization affected the, the uh, monetization on the game? Independent analysts say it's running about 50 million revenue per quarter, 200 million a year, so it's doing okay. Recapping quickly, uh, there's lots of other things you could take from here, but the three things I chose to focus on, you can improve on stale, dull, standard systems in your gameplay and delight users. You can make a game that is competitive and great for both payers and non-payers, right? Retaining and monetizing users efficiently, if you give it some thought. And if you plan well, you can afford to not sell the best items in your game and still drive tremendous revenue. Uh, in closing, we'd like to compliment you on finding the room. Thank you for coming. And Scott, uh, do we have any time for questions? Yeah, we got time for uh, one or two questions. Thank you, gentlemen. That was excellent. Does anybody uh, have a question? How do you see the fallout against uh, free-to-play games right now? Uh, it Keith and I were discussing this this morning. I mean, the European Commission just uh, made a resolution, uh, and they're specifically targeting kids' games. I think it's going to get even uh, uh, harder. Uh, I mean, there's this going to be government intervention, absolutely, uh, because there's uh, uh, it, 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 it clearly a, a problem. Um, so we'll see, we'll see what happens. Uh, it, it, the, the stuff that I was talking about, micro games, I think is related to um, uh, players are choosing games and playing them for 10, 15 minutes, regardless of how much content they have, 
So uh, there's going to be a lot of failures. And even though they're great games, there are going to be a lot of failures because there's another free-to-play game uh, uh, that came out last week. So I'm going to move on to the other one. So it's not just about making a good game, but how it gets plays to stick. And the, the, um, the prices of user acquisition are just going through the roof and are making this entire business sustainable. No, I think that's all we have time for. Thank you. Thank you.